Hey, thanks, um, Mandalay and Holly, for accommodating us and supporting this webinar. I always forget towards the end when we get busy, so I wanted to give a shout out to them. They're always the most gracious of hosts um, for our webinars, so thank you very much. Uh, I, my name is Blair Toso, and I am from Wested, and we are looking at data for continuous improvement and three-year planning today. Next slide, please. So I am joined here by my colleagues, Jessica Keach and Ayanna Smith, and you'll hear from each of them later today. They are, we are the mighty um, CAPE team over at Wested. And then, and, you know, we're also supported by many other people at Wested on building the dashboard and working on data and professional development. So the, we are here today to support you and hopefully give you some information and really uh, position this work so that you can hear from some of your colleagues in the field. Next slide. So as uh, Mandalay mentioned, we are joined by our guest presenters, Utamashke, Ilsa Pollitt, Rick Abare, and Jenna Sestone. And we're really delighted that they'll hear. I'll start us out with some background information on continuous improvement, but they'll really bring us home by giving us concrete examples of how they're using data and investigating data to prompt questions and think about their programming and engage in this continuous improvement cycle. Next slide, please. We'd also like to welcome Myra Diaz and Lindsay Williams from the Chancellor's Office. As usual, they're here supporting our work, which we really appreciate as we, um, they support the dashboard and make sense of the work. And we in turn um, help, help support the CAPE work that goes on across the state. But I'd like to turn it over to uh, Myra now to, to, to say a few words. Thank you, Blair. Just want to say uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's webinar presentation. Um, we are excited that you can join us and um, excited to hear from today's group of presenters. So thank you. Thank you for having us here. So as I said, we're going to go, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to go quickly over the continuous improvement process. We'll have a couple of activities and we'll move pretty quickly from each to, from one to the other, because we want to make sure that we stay on schedule and have a chance to learn from the field, as I mentioned, and then we'll have a little bit of time for discussion and questions and answers. Next slide, please. So these are our, um, our goals are really to be able to learn about the four continuous improvement phases, use the five whys to identify and refine the issue and think about using data to explore and identify solutions. Next slide. So continuous improvement is really about on, is an ongoing commitment to quality improvement efforts that are evidence-based, integrated into the daily work of your program and contextualized as well as iterative, which is why you see those four, um, those arrows that go around in a circle is just because you complete one cycle does not mean that um, you're finished. It's um, continually looking at, at your, your learners, your programming, your stakeholders, and seeing what works best for them. Um, continuous improvement has been shown to increase um, reaching target outcomes. It helps to decrease inefficiencies. It also helps to really identify those solutions that work because it allows for realistic planning and testing. And again, going back and forth and not uh, thinking that you found the solution the very first time. Um, it also allows for incremental um, and over time fixes. As I said, you can take off a small bite and begin to work with it there and then increasingly explore an issue over time as you would like. So you can do a small quick fix, but it isn't intended as a quick fix to your full system, right? Continuous improvement implies that you take little pieces of it, examine it and come back and we'll hear about those different efforts from your colleagues later on. Um, it does help you focus on a single issue um, and allows you to go deep so that you can identify what's going on and then come to possibly explore and come to a solution. Um, also, I did wanna note, there are many different ways of naming the phases of the continuous improvement process. This is the one they identify, plan, execute, and review is the one that I have chosen to use. But many of you are probably also familiar with plan, do, study, and act. Um, and I use this one because I like to be really intentional about identifying what you think is going on and possible solutions. But you can choose whichever one best fits you and your context and using language that resonates with you and indicates a process that you're willing to take up. Next slide, please. 
So really, when you look at identify, it's um, you are doing this by thinking about um, how you're going to use observation, data, and inquiry. You're asking about what is the problem, um, you know, what's really going on, how might we change it, and how might we address the issue. So in identify, you're not just talking about the problem, but you're also thinking about, ooh, what do we need in order to solve this? Is there an intervention or a solution or a strategy that we might be able to? use. Um, and I just want to say for anybody who joined us last week when we were looking at the equity walk, it's very similar to how one starts the equity walk, which is by using data to spur deep thinking about an issue. Next slide, please. Great. Thanks, Blair. Now we're going to put some of this thinking into practice by looking at some data and walking through a reflection activity. You're looking at data from the most recent release of the adult education pipeline. On the left, you see the number of participants by race and ethnicity that earned a diploma, GED, high school or high school equivalency in a pre-pandemic year, which is the 2018-19 year, compared to 2020-21. And on the right, you're looking at the percent uh, change, or really the percentage decline in students meeting the same outcome by race, ethnicity during the time frame. So on the left, you have the counts. On the right, you're really looking at the percentage decline by race, ethnicity, and comparing that to the state, state decline, which was about 43%. So the line represents the statewide change, and then each, each bar represents the change among that particular demographic group. So for example, between 2018-19 and 2020-21, the number of Asian students that attained a diploma, a high school diploma, GED, or high school equivalency declined by 52% compared to a 43% decline statewide. I'm gonna pause just for a minute to allow you to look at this data and, and kind of take it in. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Ayana and she's gonna kick off an activity where you are gonna be able to reflect on what you're seeing in this data. Thanks, Jessica. So we have a link to a Jamboard and Jessica or Blair, if either of you could paste that in the chat for me, please. Um, and on the Jamboard, we want you to reflect on that data that Jessica just went over with you. Um, so go ahead and click on the link. And then um, the data is there on the first slide in the Jamboard. So uh, you don't have to worry about remembering what was there. You can definitely continue looking over that data and finding what stands out to you. Um, and our discussion question is just to define the problem. What problems do you see when you look at those numbers? And so you can go ahead and create a post-it note, a sticky note to add your comments there onto the Jamboard. Okay, thank you for those of you who are already adding your comments. Ayana, can you sh maybe share the screen so people can see what's um, on the Jamboard? Yes, I wasn't sure what happened. Let's see. Can you see the Jamboard? Yeah, thank you. Okay.
This is great. I also see a couple comments on the previous slide as well, where it talks about disproportionate declines for some groups. Um, and then, yeah, was there a shift um, in delivery online that impacted some groups more than others? And yeah, look, they, it looks like when we're looking at, when I'm sorting through these, that there are, you know, challenges. People are identifying the problem that maybe uh, some groups experienced greater challenges and then what impacted them. Uh, definitely about, somebody is asking, is the, is the problem declining enrollment or attrition? Um, are folks leaving the state or are they leaving adult ed? Uh, are we not able to serve the students or do we not have enough teachers to serve a greater need not represented by this data? Um, that the number of participants declined by 17%, but the number of completers declined by 43%. Interesting, yep. So like, what's the problem? Is it, is it that goes back to somebody asking about enrollment or attrition? And then the numbers of students completing this outcome was low even before the pandemic. And that, however, the pandemic impacted some race, ethnicity groups more than others for this. Were Asians fearful to come to campus due to the racial threats they were experiencing during COVID, exactly. So that's, that's great. Let's go ahead and go back to the discussion, the slide. And keep that bit.ly link or keep, if you're in the board, keep it open because we'll go back into that. So, we wanted, once you identify that problem, one of the things that we talk about in the continuous improvement process is to sort of, is to dig into those issues, right? And that is, there's a, there's a, 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 a process of doing this called the five whys. Um, I'm just curious, has anybody used this in, in uh, trying to solution around problems that they've identified to really dig into this? Can't see if any hands are going up. So a couple of a couple of nods for those of you who have your cameras on. That's great. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jenna. So the five whys really helps to get you um, to what's really at the heart of the issue you're di you're discussing. So for example, sometimes what we think is the issue masks the real issue. For, we might say um, why our student why students aren't enrolling in IELC IELCE courses. Um, because the IET is not of interest to them. They don't want to, they're not interested in that occupation. However, if we look closer and we ask why aren't they interested in that occupation, it might be that we begin to think about, well, there are a lot of women in our classes. Maybe that is not, it's a non-traditional occupation for women. Or it might be, you know, that they're not aware of what the job is. You they can go back to the waiting Thank you. Um, or it might be that they feel that they won't. We've even heard from students who say, well, we were interested, but we didn't feel like we had enough English skills to, to be successful, or we didn't even know who to ask and where to go for it. And that each time you ask a successive why, like why isn't a student interested? Oh, well, because we think it's primarily women. Well, why do you think women aren't interested? Well, it's a non-traditional job. Oh, well, why do you think it's, a, it's not a non-traditional job? Well, there are societal perceptions about what this job is. Keep asking those whys helps you dig into it. Um, so in the other piece, when you're digging into these whys, is to take it off of being inherent in the student. We talked about this in the equity as well, is a lot of times it's about the system or our programming. So when we're asking those questions, digging into, so why aren't they? And then the next question, as opposed to being an attribute of the student might wanna be like, what is it about our society that creates that? What is it of the way our program is structured? Why don't they feel comfortable coming and talking to us as opposed to, well, they just don't have enough English to understand it. So this is also a technique that's used to get at root causes, which is um, an important process for us as well, even if we're not looking at the root cause, even if we're just trying to dig into what we want a solution around, is because it will help you refine your question and target the problem and identify solutions that address the issue. So what we're going to do now, next slide, please. 
is we're going to do a quick breakout group about practicing those whys because sometimes those whys um, uh, feel a little funny after you get that past the second one, you're like, hmm, what is that next why going to be? But if you practice it, you'll begin to see how it just sort of digs in and helps you refine into not just the problem, but then thinking about the strategy that you might want to employ or test out. So we're going to go into random breakout groups. We're going to go back to the jam board. Um, and then there will be, you'll look at your group number and go in and post on one of the jam boards, they're named, they're labeled by group one, two, three, four, five. Go ahead and use them if um, and then post your whys there. And um, Ayana, can you just quickly share the screen of that, those slides so people can see what it looks like? So there, Ayana, if it's, we'll show you, if you click on the top carrot to the right, you will see how you have gotten, you will each have a jam board that has the different whys. And just use your post-its to ask, print your first question, dig into your second question, your third, until the fifth, and see how you are able to refine that question. Are there any questions before we go into the breakout rooms? Excellent. So we'll see you in a breakout room. Looks like we're all back um, and we have some great questions that sort of popped up and it um, is interesting to see where people got stuck and where they were able to populate further. So I just wanted to quickly touch base. Um, if you flip through them, does anybody want to share like what kinds of questions you came up with and um, what new ideas or clarifications did you experience through this process? How did it refine your thinking? So anybody from group three, we can see you're on the screen. You've got a lot of questions. Yeah, hi everyone. This is Lisa. Hi, Blair. Hi. Um, I think for us, I was part of group uh, three. And you know, one of the things, the first thing that came to mind, at least for some of us, was pandemic, 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 hence our uh, little, you know, um, post-it here pandemic because, you know, that was kind of the fin kind of on the tip of our tongues for all of these enrollments, right? And then mm -hmm. so it was kind of hard to say, okay, how do we go from pandemic to another why from pandemic, right? Um, so that was kind of hard. Um, but and then we kind of talked about other whys, including kind of this, um, you know, we had already seen that there was an existing drop in K through 12 enrollments um, historically, even prior to the um, prior to the pandemic. We talked about uh, kind of external factors that were impacting our students to access um, their courses. Right. So lack of Internet, um, a lot of job loss, um, you know, food and housing insecurities, um, all of those pieces. So that's kind of where we ended up going. But, you know, I have to say it was kind of hard once you hit, you know, when you throw out a why and answer it with a pandemic. Um, I'm sure, you know, this is the first time we've had to deal with this at least um, since the last hundred years. So um, it, it is hard to kind of understand it in the context of a very unique outlier circumstance. Yeah, thanks for thanks for pushing on that one a little bit, Dulce. I think that's a really valid point, especially, but it also to the point of saying, okay, so this is the pandemic. It also makes us look at other factors, right? I think that one of the things the pandemic has, you know, why is the pandemic hit us so hard? Part of it is, you know, where you get to in that third one about being affected by factors such as digital access, right? Or to take care of family. So you're digging into not just that it's the pandemic, but why and what structures within our system was able to, you know, affected the fact that the pandemic not just sent us home and people weren't able, you know, had so many other things going in their lives, but what within our system 
had it been in place, might have been able to um, better support adult learners and, and keep them engaged. So I think that that is that it's a really interesting example of, yes, this is where we get stuck and we know the answer, but digging into it helps us identify some places to go with that. Right. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move along so that we can make sure we have time. Um, but that's exactly where it's supposed to push those kinds of discussions. It doesn't necessarily answer, but it does push discussions and make us think a bit more deeply about the issues. So then we have the continuing improvement process. We move into the plan. And this is one that you all, I'm sure, are well familiar with. Um, you know, what identifying what data do you need to collect? What activities do you need to do to collect the data? What's your timeline? Who needs to be involved? Right. And as, as you do this, you're going to want to, to continue to explore um, what intervention would you want to test? If you look at DILSAs and, you know, many of you went this route. Once you identified digital literacy, technology, people were building up uh, boot camps in response and then figuring out if that was working, provide getting to, uh, technology into um, learners' hands, uh, access to broadband. So all of those pieces were things that you all identified. It would be very interesting to see that how you all landed on you know, what you all thought the effectiveness of those strategies were. So next slide, please. We're going to do a chat, but I think we're going to go ahead and continue on. And so that it would have just been like essential to that planning process is, is identifying the, um, the, the data that you would like to um, collect. And then there's the execute, which is where you're really implementing your plan. Um, and throughout this, you want to make sure you're taking kind of, kind of, um really uh, concrete and copious notes because that's part of your data collection is understanding the process that you're going through. Um, you're gonna wanna stay true to your plan unless when you're revisiting it in the midstream that you, you as a collective are already able to say, this strategy is not working. And so we need to go back to that identify and plan section. And then you would swerve back, but you would have like that mini review in there. And you can do that pretty quickly if you're executing and something isn't working. Um, you wanna make sure that you're engaging your stakeholders. And then even before you get to the review process, you wanna to begin to see if any patterns or trends are emerging from that process. Next slide. And then the review is really about what are you learning? You'll analyze your data and determine whether your intervention or strategy has worked. Um, and that can be simply, yes, let's go forward and continue um, looking at it and implementing it and maybe turn our eyes to a different issue. Or it might also be a question is, okay, it's working, but does it need to be tweaked? And you'll see that within your data. Um, and you'll be asking questions about what you, what action steps you wanna take and why and then identifying those next steps. And just because you've hit the review space, you um, that doesn't mean it's over. You may want to test a strategy or intervention again, um, beginning the cycle there, or you want to abandon your strategy and revisit and start with something new. Or you may just want to say, this is great. Let's move on to something else and begin that identify, plan, execute, and review process again. Um, regardless, you really don't want to abandon your work. You'll want to take, you know, look back at what you've done, even if it doesn't work, because that's a historical look at what you have been doing and what you may not want to consider again. Um, and the other piece that you can learn about this is establishing a process for going through these continuous improvements as you identify issues in your work. You can use the same process and uh, procedures that you have already identified if they have worked for you and your team. Um, and then you'll always want to be continually monitoring your solution, even if you've identified that it works and you're moving on to a new issue. Keep those pieces in place so you can monitor and then make adjustments as maybe something in your consortium changes and your program changes, whether that's learners, new labor market information, or just new stakeholders. Does anybody have any questions before we go on to some of the com uh, some concrete examples of how this gets applied? Super. We're going to hear from um, South Bay Consortium for Adult Education first, and we'll move to East Region. Can you go back one more sec? 
Thanks, East Region Adult Education Consortium, and then we'll move to the Silicon Valley, and they'll each have been looking at a different issue and how they've worked through that. If you can either post your questions in the chat or hold them into the end so that we can make sure everybody has a chance to have a converse to participate, and then we'll have a discussion time at the end. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Ilsa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you to the West Ed team and Cape Tab team for inviting us from the South Bay Consortium for Adult Ed to share a little bit about our experience with um, continuous improvement and using data for continuous improvement. Uh, we wanted to touch on uh, two broad areas where this applies in our consortium. And um, one is in our day-to-day -day consortium work as a consortium as a whole, how do we approach um, data and how do we um, commit to using it as a continuous improvement um, opportunity. And then of course, we're in a three-year planning year. So we also wanna share a little bit more about how we have used data in our three-year planning process um, and how that is really informing uh, and shaping our strategic plan for the next three years. Um, so I'll start by talking a bit more about as a consortium overall, how do we look at data? And then my colleague, Rick Bear will talk about how we approach the three-year planning process um, and using data in that one. Um, so as a consortium overall, we, we made a commitment uh, three years ago in, the, so in our active three-year plan to be a data-informed consortium. Um, and I'm, I was happy to see that uh, what was shared today was, was a cycle and it was not a linear process. So this whole cycle of review, identify, plan, execute, it's an iterative process and, and you go back and forth and you can make small changes or bigger changes and then just always reassess and go back to your, go back to the drawing board. And that's really how it has been for us as a consortium. Um, and when I look at that, um, that circle, that cycle of continuous improvements, I would say as a consortium, we are somewhere in between the review and identify stages of um, continuous improvement. Um, and that may be surprising because we've been at this for about three years or even more now, um, but it really was important for us in order to be able to review our data to be able to trust our data. So we actually spend um, a, a long time and a good amount of effort in really making sure that we trust our data, that everybody, everybody in our consortium understands where the data is coming from, how it flows from the student information system into TE, into, into, um, into Nova, into LaunchBoard. Like it's a complex landscape that we're operating in. We are um, the only consortium in the state that has two community college districts. So it makes it a little more complicated. And we have five adult schools who, not, who don't all use the same student information system. So it was really a puzzle to understand how everything flows and how everything comes together. Um, and then the other piece of that is making sure that there is uniformity in how we collect and report data across our members so that when we look at data at the consortium level, we are comparing apples to apples and we're talking about the same thing. So we really built our capacity to understand our data, to talk about our data, to develop that data literacy among our members, to even have the conversations. So, we do that um, in quarterly data study sessions where we look at our um, enrollment data uh, overall and enrollment data broken out by program area. And that has just been a very helpful process uh, and really engaging to be looking at our data at a consortium level. Uh, and then those, the questions, the whys come up almost um, automatically because you'll look at numbers, you see numbers coming down and someone will raise their hand and say, oh, why, why is that? I see this ESL go up here, but ESL go down there with another member. Um, so we do have those why questions. Um, in the next three years, I think we are going to move as a consortium into that planning and executing uh, phase and really responding to what we're seeing in the data. I feel like we, we have a strong foundation now as to being able to talk about our data, to trust the data that we're looking at. We have um, the space in our quarterly data study sessions to, um, to take the time to really dig into the data with all of our members. And so the next step will be for us to not only identify 
uh, the problems and talk about the whys, but also ask that question as to what are we going to do, which strategies are we going to um, develop and employ to address some of these areas. Um, and the area in which we think we'll see the most activity is in the in the transitions piece. So I think that's where it really comes down to consortium level work to look at globally across our nine members, how are students moving in between our schools and our colleges and are the pathways that we developed, are they really working? Are people transitioning where we would expect them to transition? And if they're not, what kind of support do they need? Uh, what kind of programmatic changes can we make to increase those transitions? So that's going to be a big focus in, um, in our next three-year plan. Um, so I think that's going to globally as a consortium where we are. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rick um, to talk more specifically about how we use data in our three-year planning process. Cool. Thank you, Ilsa. And uh, echoing my thanks to everyone from the West Ed and Cape Tap teams for having us. Uh, this is a lot of fun to get to hear from, uh, from you and from other people about how they're using data for these types of really important initiatives. Um, because uh, uh, Ilsa had mentioned that we do our quarterly data study sessions, um, that in conjunction with using uh, the CAPE fact sheets and launch board and several other tools, which I'll get into a little bit more in a second, allowed us to almost get meta with our own process and decide how we were gonna improve the way that we approach the sharing of data internally and, um, and aligning ourselves to, to the three-year plan. Um, uh, uh, Ilsa created a really great plan for us to start, I think it was back in August, by doing essentially following the playbook of the requirements of the three-year plan, which was to identify our gaps to start with. So we looked at the fact sheets um, and to do a sort of a make sure we were on top of our regional need, um, which helps inform those three-year plan activities. We built a, uh, we call it a CTE matrix, but it's functionally a big list of all the CTE programs that we, um, that we offer so that we could help identify gaps in conjunction with folks from our local uh, work to future, um, folding in labor market data to see, hey, what do we offer? What's in demand that we don't offer? What's in demand that we do offer, but we may need to create a pathway for? Um, so that type of, of activity was basically step one. Step two was to leverage the data study session space to engage the stakeholders from the rest of, from our members. Because it's one thing if, if us as a consortium team just sit around and think about all this, but we need to hear from everybody. We need to get them bought in on why we're thinking what we're thinking, especially when we want them to sign up for activities that we they say they're going to do for the next three years. So we, we took that space and we we did a few interesting activities that I thought were really uh, were really valuable to hear back from. So we looked at, um, there's a great online mapping interface called the Healthy Places Index that's active in California. And it's a zip code by zip code breakdown of, a, I think it's eight, to eight it's a, an index that they create at a zip code level of eight to 10 education health uh, type measures where they rank in percentiles, each of those measures, and then they create an index out of that. Um, that is a great way for us to stay in touch with, hey, we all think we know what the need is like around us, but does that actually match up? Like, how does that match up with actual data? Following that, we took, we, we, we basically just created a map of our region and loaded all of the students' zip codes into sort of a density map to see, are we serving the students who we need to be serving? Um, and tried to spend some time thinking about um, understanding that in the context of the Cape Fact Sheets view on regional need, which is very top down. Um, uh, related to the exercise we sort of just did, uh, we did our, our biggest change here is um, in our region has been our ESL enrollment. And uh, we wanted to take a deeper look about uh, halfway through last year as we were, I'm sorry, um, I think it was, it was in September, we were, uh, maybe November, we were trying to, to figure out, well, who's coming back and how is that different? And one of the great exercises that we did was, um, uh, was to look at the, the race ethnicity is a really tough proxy. Uh, we have a, a lot of folks who are identified by these tools as Asian, um, but 
um, they're, they come from all over the, all over, uh, the world and, and have to get kind of lumped into that category. So to try to ameliorate that, we actually looked at language spoken at home, um, which gave us a better indication about, we have a large Vietnamese population here. Um, it gave us a better indication who's returning to school in 2021. Um, what does that even look like? So that kind of helped us dig a little bit deeper into some of the ways that we were, that, that different groups of people felt more maybe or less comfortable coming back and what we could potentially do about that. Um, we followed that up with uh, diving deep into LaunchBoard um, to, to make sure we we're as clear as we can be. It's still a work in progress on our data definitions to ensure that as Ilsa talked about, do we even know what we're talking about? Um, to make sure that when we look at data that it's aligned to the way that that we're defining these adult ed metrics in LaunchBoard um, so that we can populate um, goal setting trackers in preparation for this three year plan. Uh, that's been the most recent work we've done. We've gone around and done one on ones with all of our schools and uh, looked at what we have for their last three years and had individual conversations about what strategies they were comfortable taking and what what goals they wanted to set around um, which optional metrics that align to our plan. So um, it has been a journey over the course of the year of taking our, our data study sessions, which were often just a, it was a place for us to look at our enrollment. It was a place for us to discuss uh, data related issues that we needed to have on a consortium level understanding on and actually use it to do the three-year plan, but then going from that to improve on, on this is to align the quarterly data study sessions to these metrics and monitor progress on this stuff so that we're fully aligned as a consortium with the way that we're reporting or the way that we're goal setting based on our three-year plan. Um, so I think I wanted to do that faster. If I do have one more minute, I did wanna just give a shout out to that, uh, that launch board for equity analysis session. That was a really great session. Um, I think there's some really valuable tools that are immediately turnkey to working at a member level. It's, um, I actually, as part of two years ago's regional need analysis for that annual plan, um, we walked in, we went into launch board and we examined outcomes and divided those out by demographics and looked to see if we could find any um, uh, equity issues that were very obvious between percentages of groups achieving outcomes. So I just, I think the tool is really good and there's a lot of value to that. Um, I think that's pretty much, did I forget anything, Ilsa? No, I think you covered everything. Thank you, Rick. And yeah, we're looking forward to any, any questions or comments and yeah, please uh, feel free to contact us if you have any questions about this. Thanks, Ilsa and Rick. Um, I'm, we, will, we should have time at the end for some questions. I know I have questions, so um, hopefully we'll get to that point. I, but at this point, um, can we go ahead and switch over to Uta and Uta talk a little bit about your process? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for having me and thanks for that and Cape for uh, having me here. Uh, I, I want to share the screen in a moment uh, to share a little bit, I think along the same lines that Elsa and Rick brought up, consortium wide, but then also trust building internally for next steps within that, that concept of continuous improvement. Um, so the first more consortium wide, our consortium only has three members, one of which takes about 95% of all the programming. And when we moved into uh, the strategic planning process for, for the next three years, we ran into this issue, how can we ever compare our work with one partner when one partner has 95% of the students and the other one has, has a handful. Um, the, so we needed to, to, to find a way to compare, as also already said, apples to apples, right? Uh, and we needed to, to, per request, we wanted to simplify it, um, make it more easy to work with without dumbing it down. So we decided together, and that's what you see on my screen now, we decided together on the key points we wanna measure and similar to South Bay, Transitions is what matters, right? How do we measure successful transitions across very different partners? So we created together this, this spreadsheet as a preliminary first draft of a metrics that we could use when one 
member has 20 students and the other one has say 8,000. We can still measure transitions. We started looking at the data in Launchboard and then compared to the data we had internally. And we discovered just by um, uh, identifying those descriptors, some discrepancies that allowed us to start a conversation. Um, as you can see in column A, we had those ca the categories that will look familiar to most of you. It's, it's, it's uh, outcomes reports, right? Uh, uh, and sometimes even summary reports. We discovered discrepancies that allowed us to have a really insightful conversation that also led to that trust building that Elsa was talking about. Right? So our welding class is one of the most successful ones. We routinely every single term have 24 completers. When I look in launch board, I have five. Uh, we, we, we then did sort of a backward design. If it's only five in launch board, what's happening in top scroll, what's happening in our internal data tracking system, where, where's the hiccup? Uh, and we included not just program directors and our data tag, but then also the teachers. And I think after all these years, it was the first time that a teacher had this aha moment and understood uh, what data entry means and the consequences uh, the lack thereof has, right? So that was a, it was a refreshing conversation because I don't think the teacher ever connected the dots that way. This measuring transitions also, I think for the very first time allows us to include our transition services in the metrics, right? There is not really a space yet in our reporting to the states where we, where we can report on our work in transition and student support services. At the college's side, there are different uh, mechanisms to do so, but at K-12 adult schools, we usually don't have a space other than in the update record, those three boxes, but we don't really have a space where we can, we, we, where we can report our work in student support services. So we created these descriptors for our transition services, for example, leveraging transition services for co-enrollment with colleges. Um, to finally have a tool to report our work that is so crucial with adult learners, right? The support system around classes, around uh, uh, training programs. Uh, so we now also have internally a tool that we can use with teachers, with our governing board to make a case for solid transition services. And I think we also have, a, we also finally have the beginnings of a matrix that allows us to make a case to the state that we need to invest in these transition, transition and support services way more than we do. Right? The program outcomes we, we now measure usually don't include these, these support services outside of the classroom. Um, we have also been working on, on, a, on a better, more insightful, more, more trusting data dialogue. When we talked about improvements internally, we, disc we, we wanted to measure what happens between orientation and initial pre-testing and start of classes. And we had quite a few, quite a high number of students dropping out between, they took the pre-test, but they wouldn't show up for classes. And we wanted to figure out what's going on there. So, so what we decided on was we, we looked at scores and placement data, um, just following the NRS guidelines, um, and this is color coded here. The, and I wanted to share this one um, for two reasons. Number one, not too surprising, um, we actually discovered that we had students in our pre literacy classes who didn't belong there, right? We also decided actually there is no pre literacy. This is beginning ESL. We want to modify, revise our curriculum to better address the needs of those students who test in the so-called lower scores. Um, we, just looking at these scores and these data, we, we decided together to revise our uh, 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 pre-testing and welcoming sessions for students. And uh, we actually introduced a, a more extensive welcoming session for our students to help them understand how assessments, how pre-testing works. 
that already has impact. We are measuring now the attrition rates between testing and uh, starting classes, participating in classes. And I think we can already see a correlation between a solid introduction to how assessments work and why we do them and students staying with us, starting classes, staying in classes. So, so these, these two tools um, or conversations about data connect, right? Because transitions are only possible when the student starts classes. Um, so by, by sort of aligning a larger conversation across consortium partners with the conversation almost one-on-one -on -one with teachers and our proctors, that has two improvements for both for the students, but also curriculum review and the creation of a new welcome session for our students. Um, this whole conversation um, came up because we're using LaunchBoard a lot more nowadays um, than we ever did before. Um, and of course, these discrepancies we saw didn't really sit well with us. So we dug a little bit deeper in our own internal data. So that's, that's the broadest overview. A lot of it mirrors what Ilsa and Rick described. Thanks, Uta. Yeah, it's really interesting to begin to see the trends um, come out. Uh, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that afterwards because it's interesting how the this continuous improvement process loans itself to particular pieces and pieces that you've pulled out that are really important. But before we go to that, it would be great if we can go on to Jenna. Welcome, Jenna. You're on mute. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jenna Chestone from Silicon Valley. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see, okay. Um, here we go. So we did a similar um, data dive and a cycle of inquiry when we saw similar things to what everybody is uh, talking about, all the speakers who have talked so far where we saw our high school enrollment dropping significantly. And this is above and beyond what um, can be attributed to the pandemic. Uh, we just didn't see our students returning and it wasn't necessarily attributable to a demographic, any kind of specific demographic group. And when we did our five whys and we kept asking the teachers and student what they were hearing so we could complete our TOPS report, um, we would hear similar things to what you all hear. We've spoken about this at our consortium meeting ad nauseum about no transportation, lack of accessibility to technology, could not participate in the Zoom, uh, did not understand the curriculum, could not get um, the biggest sticking point, and we've talked about this, is the math. The math was too rigorous or it was just not accessible and so we kept trying to think, what could we do? Where could we go? How could we figure out another plan? Well, we queried our consortium and uh, it was varied. Schools were doing different things. One solution was independent study. And that seems to work well for many of our adult schools. Our school in particular does not have independent study. So that wasn't even an option for us. Um, we also were um, given a uh, directive by our superintendent to be in person. We had to be in person. <laughs> so that was very troublesome for us because many of our students kept saying, well, you have a program that's in person five days a week for three hours a day with mandatory attendance, and I just can't do that. I'm working and living on the gig economy. My schedule is fluctuating, so from week to week, some folks would be on a night schedule, some would be in a day schedule. So we were constantly changing students around. It just wasn't working for us. So through that, we reached out and found through CASAS, um, the problem, how could we find a program that would fit our students and our students' needs? Okay, so we polled our students. Um, and we polled our teachers what they were seeing. And that data suggested, yes, they don't have childcare, but we have CalWORKs on site. Some students didn't qualify for that. 
no transportation. We got them through our transition program passes. But even though we're on the VAT line, um, the transit takes two hours from their location to get to us. It's very laborious. So they miss class anyway. <laughs> we don't have independent study. We don't have a laptop rental program anymore. And we really didn't meet the DEI equity requirements. You know, we, the students who were coming in, we were having a really hard time servicing them. The consortium was very gracious, gracious to us and they actually um, contracted with an outside uh, person qualified to test. Um, and I understand that Dr. Williams goes around to different um, adult eds. And so we're, we're lucky to have him one day a week but we really need a lot more for our AWD that we're seeing coming through. And so in addition, our, fall, our falling enrollment needed another thing. So what did the students want? We queried them, what do you want? They all want online hybrid classes. They all want it, but they wanna to come to class too. They want access to a real human being. They want access to teachers. They want flexible schedules. So we came up, we, this is the data. It's very clear that all of our ESL folks, they want five days in person. ESL was drastically different than our high school diploma folks, drastically different. And so all of these, you can see, hey, I want flexible schedule. I want one day a week with my teacher. I want two evenings on, on off. I wanna be able to come in the morning and come at night, depending on my work schedule. So high school diploma was all over the place. The data bore it out. And we said, what can we do? So out of our students, we queried, um, if would you take more classes if the schedules changed? 42% said yes. That's real data from our high school. And so I took that to my superintendent. And we chose the NEDP, the National External Diploma Program, uh, mostly because it's well vetted. I'm a, you know, New York resident, former New York resident, I know this program well. I said, hey, I'll take this on. It's been around since 1975. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. Um, it's very successful, well vetted. Most of us are using pre and post testing CASAS anyway. So I started this pilot program and got it through our board here. It's very good. Um, as for folks who fit all of this criteria that kept bubbling up organically, too much anxiety, time tests from pandemic, pandemics or otherwise, they have work or other obligations, they struggle with higher math. Some of them are non-native English speakers. Um, some of them just wanted to work independently. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, we had student testimonials. Um, and teachers could see the relevance of the curriculum. So how do we identify students? What do we actually do? In our, or we pre-test them. They need to meet that threshold of 230 in math and 236 in reading as a gatekeeper. Um, in orientation, we have this conversation with them. People are coming to us from all over the world, okay? So in our, our orientation, we have this conversation. How do I finish my high school diploma in California? What do I do? If I, if I know the traditional 150 unit in adult ed, maybe you have 30 or under, you know, and you just missed a couple of things like government or economics or English for your senior year, great. The traditional high school diploma is for you. We wouldn't recommend any DP. The GED high set class, that's four or five tests. That's the class that teaches and prepares you to take those tests. It's a class that is test driven. It's very specific. And you could be in that class for years if your one stumbling block is that high set math test. We're seeing it. We're seeing people try their best and really stumble in that area. So they're frustrated. That's another little data area. That's a niche piece of data that we asked the high set um, GED teacher, you know, why are these um, students languishing? What do they need to graduate? Why have they been in your class for so long? Jenna, they only need the math. 
They only need the math. I'm like, oh, if only we had had another program, we would have put them in there first and they would have been done. So the NED program, it's virtual. It's all virtual. Students work independently. They come in on site one day a week and they do in office checks with the teacher. The great thing is that if you have 70 units, 80 units, 30 plus units, it doesn't matter. You can go in that program and you're done in a finite amount of time, six to 12 months. It's finite and it's all depending on how much time and effort you put into it. Um, the curriculum, this is very nitty gritty. The curriculum works very well with IET ready transitional and community college pathways. So their schedule is not locked to this five days a week, three hours a day high school diploma program. They're now available to take a welding class two days a week because they're working on this high school diploma. They can take medical assisting at night, two days a week, and they can work on those pathways, which before they're like, oh, I can't do it because I have to juggle my schedule and do my high school diploma first, and then I'm gonna start my pathway class. And I'm like, no, you should be in this NED program. It's gonna help you, and you'll be able to take this GED. You'll be able to take this IET uh, trades class that you're interested in for your career. So that was really our driving force. Well, I said that I would take lead in all of our consortium. So any school in our consortium that has this kind of student, we would take them on because a lot of the schools, uh, you need to be someone who's not afraid to learn a new technology. It is a standalone technology. So I think it makes a lot of sense as a consortium to have one school pilot this kind of a program. That makes a lot of sense because you can see what it would take. And then the teachers would eventually find one or two other teachers in other adult eds and then slowly it would grow like that well immediately we had 12 or 15 students sign up for this right away they were like this this is for me i want this right away we have a very successful student who is in that class right now um and i would love to tell you more i know i'm very limited on time today but i would love to tell you more and i could take you actually to the inside of the portal. I can show you through CASAS how to get in and I can show you the exact work because I think lots of times in the, in different consortiums that have heard of NEDP before, they the teachers always wanted to see, show me the work, show me the curriculum, show me what that looks like. And now that you have one person in that, I can see exactly what they're doing. And it is rigorous. It's very rigorous. It's very relevant to adult eds. The math is consumer math, and I know some colleges have consumer math, but it makes sense to them. They're learning things like APR and credit cards, how to get a mortgage, you know, how to pay for prescriptions, how to budget, how to do a household budget. So the math is something that's adult relevant as, a full, as opposed to, you know, algebraic equations and Pythagorean theorem and word problems that are very mind bending for some of our folks. So I would love to go on. I'm not sure about my time. I could go deep or we can save it to the end, but that's just it in a nutshell. This is kind of the most critical piece is that all of our data kept pointing to something that we're just missing. We, we just kept missing and organically the same things kept coming up. We needed to satisfy a virtual flexible program for high school diploma. We needed something that was well vetted. This has been around for decades. You know, it works very well for working people. We needed something that was in our IET that was could play well with our pathways that we have planning because we have a lot of trades and a lot of classes on our site in particular. And we needed to um, satisfy all the other issues that kept coming up. If, if some folks want to go slower, great. If you want to go fast, great. And we're there along the way. But anytime people want to go on a deep dive with me, um, I can do that with you. And I can also point you in direction of um, Janita and Kay at CASAS. 
and I'll be happy to give you their emails as well. Okay. Super. Thanks so much, Jenna, and to Ilsa and Rick and Uta. I think that I really appreciate the offer that you all have extended to your colleagues. Part of the reason why we bring um, your you know, your programs to come and present on the work that you're doing is so that other people in the field know both, you know, some of the solutions and the things that people wrestle with, but also to be able to make those connections. If you're looking at transitions, reaching out to Elsa, Rick, and Uta about some of the work that they're doing, or to Jenna, when you're looking at those gaps in maybe in high school, that high school equivalency, um, high school diploma attainment, um, and, and thinking about the solutions that they've come to. So um, well, I'd like to go ahead and open it up. We can move forward to, yep, the discussion slide. This is a time for people who have questions for any of our presenters. It's a very quiet group out there today. So I am not naturally quiet. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask my question. Like, it's really interesting to me to hear that this process that you all took, um, particularly Ilsa and Rick, um, I know you were talking about a three-year process that you've really gone on this journey to begin to explore this. And I was curious, like, how do you find the patience to stick to it for three years and you know, engage your stakeholders in this journey with you? That's a great question. And I think part of it is us like having having um, Rick in his role as as data analyst, who you know I think challenges us to step on the brakes when we need to and say like, okay, we can look at these numbers, but I'm not sure if I can trust this. So let's 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 go back and let's make sure that that we know what where these numbers are coming from that we're talking about the same thing so i think that's that's in part due to um rick's insistence as a as a data person making sure that you know we're looking at things that make sense um and i think our members want to un really want to understand their numbers too i mean we see that desire across the board of uh, members um wanting to know what is going on and how that and whether or not the data reflects accurately what is going on at their schools so when we look at data you know people will point out and say things like you know i see like maybe like like a like Udu was saying, um, we see five people in in launch board, but we think we have more. So let's let's go back and see what's what's going on, right? So we get those questions a lot from our members that like point out discrepancies that we're not able to see at a consortium level, but our members on the ground see what's going on in the classes and and can tell us if what they what we're looking at makes sense or not. So I think it just kind of happens organically. Uh, and having our data study sessions that are, is a, just a great place to ask these questions and keep coming back to um, building our data literacy and understanding what's going on. Thank you. Rick, did you want to add to that? I see you off mute. Yeah, I would just say, I mean, to, to add an example, uh, there's been so many times where we've said, um, one of the ways that I had we had initially, like for me, was to, um, we have data coming from Tops Pro, but our colleges were not WIOA after 1920. And the process for pushing data from their, their systems of record to Tops Pro was, uh, was rough, shall we say. So we had to look at, we couldn't look at that data all next to each other. We couldn't just export summary data and say, well, we actually have more students than that. Well, how many? Well, I don't know. You know what I mean? So we had to build the the sort of the how do we talk about how many students we served in a way that was operationally um, uh, cons as consistent as it can be between adult school and college, because the 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 way that those systems function is so different. So um, we decided to just start. We wanted to build people's capacity to look at a lot of information at once. You were looking at a graph that has three variables or more on it where you You've broken out by institution for enrollment. You're looking at year over year and you're looking at quarter by quarter and watching cumulative enrollment and comparing it year over year. Well, then you have a pandemic and now you can't do that anymore. But 
The, um, but that was a great place to be able to, to build people's capacity to look at, at relatively complex information um, and get used to seeing it. Because after we had done that for a few quarters, people started saying, hey, wait, I, I should have 50 people in workforce prep and you don't have any for me, why not? And we would say, well, let's go, go, into, go into your TOPS Pro and check how your courses are coded. Um, or I see, I have way too many people in ASE, why? I don't know, but let's find out. And that was where you found out like, oh, we realized one of our classes was actually miscoded. We went back and fixed it. So just even stuff like that is, is very, very valuable because when you, you know, when you hit submit on that data in July 15, that's what the state thinks you had. Anything you do after that, that you fix, it's, it's good for you to know what actually happened on the ground, but, you know, but in the, in the eyes of, of CDE, it doesn't matter. So at least just having those, that was just kind of a small example of the ways in which people have been able to like build their own capacity to look at that stuff and say, hey, this is a good touch point for me to say, I don't think, I think something's wrong. Um, so yeah, so snaps to, to just at least at the very least getting that done. Thank you. I think that kind of rolls into the next question, which is what has been the most successful strategy you've used in helping faculty, teachers, stakeholders, partners build trust in the data? And all, th all, all four of you talked about, you know, get, needing to get people to buy in and trust the data before you could really move forward. I think we are at the level of buy-in, trust, it still comes and goes. <laughs> and I mean, with all data, right? We are all in, in ways suspicious of it. But I think for us, there were two observations that teachers themselves voiced sort of unease with too many of our students in, in what we called pre, or what they wanted to call pre-literate. Right? And, and, and we were wondering, why is that the case? Why all of a sudden do we have so many who stay in that in that class for sometimes half a year? How can that be when the understanding of, of foundational literacy is that that you prepare a student to start their journey as an English language learner? So so that sort of unease, discomfort that to let's look at at scores, let's look at data with the students you have right now and 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 check. And just by the, the scores are not all there is, but it gave us a baseline to re review whom are we working with? How are we working with them, right? We, we, we all, I think, favor a strengths-based, asset-based approach, but sometimes that gets lost in the classroom. So this was a good reminder of reviewing how are we working with students and, and that our goal is really transition, right? If, and then if our outcomes really transitions, let's backward design, what do we need to change? And I think this, it started with the teacher saying, I have too many students. So by addressing her need, her unease, that, that helped a little bit. The other one is for us, we started, I mean, like I'm sure like many of us, we are looking at ethyl gains, right? Because that sort of gives us a very, a somewhat, a, a rather objective, clean look at, at, and, at data and we can compare, right? So it's not so much the, the raw numbers, but the percentage. What is our sort of trajectory across the years? And I think even during the pandemic, it, you can percentage wise, it's still a good comparison. But us all looking at the same data at the same time, I think we started to build a little bit of, of buy-in that this process might, might just work if we do it continuously. So in a way, the powers in presenting Apple gains in one spreadsheet across a couple of years so that, that the comparison is already made for the ones who look at the data. Um, there was a question in the chat about our welcome session. When we looked at the scores in, our, in this prep pre-literate foundational literacy class, um, some of this came from some teachers suspecting that quote unquote students don't take the assessment seriously. Um, um, so we wanted to change that mindset in this in this welcome in those welcome sessions we have. We first introduced like many of you I'm sure what is adult education about? Why are we here? How do we want to support an adult learner 
in transitioning. And one of the goals of transition is for us to accelerate the experience in each class, right? So that they start at the right point and move to the next point um, as effectively and efficiently as possible. Uh, so in these welcome sessions, then once explaining what adult ed has to offer, we also talk about test taking culture in the United States, about how assessments work for us, why we use the tests or assessments we use, and then we show the group how it works, how to go through it. So we set the stage, right? We sort of do a, 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 a little bit of a preview of what the test is like and why we're doing it. And that the point is really to get them out of our class as fast as possible. And that seems to, taking the time to explain that, we do that with interpreters. Uh, makes a huge difference also in the in the willingness of students to stay with us for two hours or three hours. Thank you. Ilsa, Jenna, Rick, did you have anything you wanted to add to the discussion on building um, trust and data? Um, yeah, I, I do. I think the consistency is important and I heard Uta talk about that too, just keep showing the same visuals quarter after quarter, month after month, and, and that that creates familiarity and, and comfort in talking about these numbers. Um, so that has really helped in our, um, in our experience. And then the other thing is, and I believe Uta mentioned that as well, it's for, for teachers and other staff to see how what they're doing in their day-to-day -day practice in their classroom ends up in what we report to the state or what we look at as a consortium like it's it's i think people generally want to understand like why do i have to check this box in my student information system and what what is the outcome for that like what does that lead to um and we've had those um uh conversations i think with with faculty happens at more at the school level than at the consortium level um but with our team of transition specialists, we absolutely have that conversation with them regularly about like what you do as a transition specialist, how you enter data related to your meetings with students, that matters, that shows us something, we can learn something from that. And people generally want to understand how the data flows in the consortium and what their unique role and contribution is in that. Yeah, I definitely echo that. I, I do think we live it on a micro level every day and our teachers live it on a micro level. They're dealing with the data of their class every day. But something that the consortium did that was really useful is that when we had our work day, they brought in that guest speaker who talked about global trends. And I think it's really important to look at those global trends because that really explains a lot about how across all industries are getting affected by either migration, war, different industries that live and die and have peaks and valleys and all of that affects what we do. Yeah, so that was very useful to keep looking at that data as well. It's all useful. That's an inter interesting tactic of depersonalizing the data, which is um, interesting as being able to bring them in from that space. The other piece that I thought was interesting that you all have all talked about also is really personalizing the data by not letting your thinking, like while you're going through this continuous improvement process and you're identifying these issues, it seems like one of the first things that you also do is address someone else's question sort of in that space of knowing that if you can't answer that question, they're going to be stuck on that. So each of you have also forwarded the way you've talked about um, somebody raises a question. So you talk about that, even though it may not exactly be what you're talking about. And it's a really interesting, fine balance to listen to you all juggle all of these different moving pieces about making data trustworthy through personalizing, globalizing, responding, demonstrating the importance of where each person touches that data. And then that rises to the top to explain or at least inform the way different issues get um, 
get um, positioned. Jen, I think you did a great job of answering um, people's questions in the chat about the NEDP. And I just wanted to ask, um, uh, one was posed about, is the program designed for out-of-state students? Um, I don't know what they mean. If you're out of state, then you can't be and you can't be tied to an adult ed program and do in office checks. So, in office checks are um, face to face. Um, I think if they're traveling for work, they could do a remote in office check. Um, they still have to be tied to a school. It's not the issuing school that gets the high school diploma will be Silicon Valley Adult Ed. So for example, the National External Diploma Program, they will give you that, but then we are the teachers who are tied to that program. So I'm not sure I understand the question. So I think that if what you're saying is that NEDP is a national program, however, the, the, um, uh, the administration of it is localized, right? Yes. So it would not yes. be something that you would do with someone who was not enrolled right. in the program. If right. your program allows out-of-state students, that's great. But there's also yeah. this piece of having to come in and have a, a personalized check-in, which is right. one of the strengths of that program is that there are a lot of different ways that this program keeps people enrolled, engaged, and moving along that very fast timeline. To, uh, to We had a student from Iran who asked that question can I go ahead and go back to Iran and stay enrolled? So it's not quite a standalone university just on its own. It doesn't, it doesn't function that way. So that's a really good qualifying question. Yeah. Super, thank you. We have just a few more minutes. Um, if you have more questions, put them in the chat, but I think we're gonna move forward and um, bring, bring this presentation to a close. So can we go to the next uh slide, Diana? So one of the ways that we use to reflect on learnings, which is also a great way to um, prompt when you present new information um, on the continuous improvement process and you're doing a, a learning or you've presented information um, and you want like people to reflect on that. And again, you know, it's always that interplay of what, how do people interact with the information um, that you're presenting to them? And it's, we use a um, way of doing this. It's like, what is something we discussed that squared with your experience, right? What resonates with you? Um, what are three points you want to remember? And then what's something that's still lingering around in your mind just because we presented information? Um, what, it hasn't answered everything or maybe it's prompted new questions. So normally I would ask people to sort of reflect on your learnings at this point um, and then either post something in the chat about three points you wanna remember or what, what question is still lingering in your mind about either continuous improvement process or what um, people are doing in their consortium and how it relates to you. So let's go ahead and move forward, please. Um, I just wanna point out, we still have some upcoming webinars. We have the second part of our Exploring Equity. Um, and in June, we're really rolling out our dashboard, which is the um, Adult Education to Workforce um, dashboard tool. And then talking about how that can help identify gaps and um, position uh, and prompt you to explore how your educational offerings align with uh, labor market information, similar to what Rick and Ilsa are already doing. They talked about that point in there, looking at the gaps between what they're offering and, and, and what the pathways might be. Um, I'm gonna take this moment to confess that I did not put people's email on the PowerPoint. We will fix that before we send it out, but I wanted to give um, Ilsa, Rick, Uta, and Jenna not just a huge thank you for presenting and sharing your work. I think it's always courageous to share your work because we know through our continuous improvement process, there's always a place where we can re-look re at it, but um, your work is so strong and innovative that it's also so very exciting that you'll take the time to share it with your colleagues. So please pop your email in the chat um, and I just say thank you and thanks again to SCOE Chat um, and to everyone for joining us today. All right, well, while they do that, I'll go ahead and just um, close us out. We really wanna say thank you to the West Ed team, Blair, Jessica, Ayana for this presentation along with the um, guest presenters. 
um, Uta, Jenna, Elsa, and Rick. And then again, thank you to Myra and Lindsay for joining us from the Chancellor's Office. We really appreciate everyone that stayed on and uh, participated with us today. Um, and we'll go ahead and keep it open for just another minute or so while you go ahead and grab those email addresses. Also, please take note that we have popped in an evaluation link. So that does help inform how we continue to um, take some deeper dives, different areas of um, that areas where we can improve um, and our presenters as well. So please take a few moments um, and provide us that very valuable feedback. We'll also follow up with the direct email, um, giving you that link as well. All right, thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Bye everyone.